Hello guys, what is happening and welcome to this video. So I am sorry if the lighting is really bad in here. It is like I've got lights from both sides. I got nothing in front. So it probably looks like I am really, really sunburned, but it's not that bad. <laughs> well, yeah, anyways. <laughs> so anyway, guys, um, yeah, here in Mexico, arrived on Saturday, fantastic here, um, you know, amazing atmosphere. We've been doing a lot of snorkeling, going to the beach, that sort of stuff, checking out different areas, seeing what's available, prices and how much condos and houses are here. And it's pretty interesting. I'm thinking about doing a video about it. So if you're interested in a video like that, leave a comment below. And I can definitely do one. I didn't know whether anybody would be interested. So I haven't done one yet. So let me know. Um, so anyway, guys, the bond market has been really, really blowing up today. I mean, um, as you guys know, macro is a passion of mine. And I'm always keeping tabs on the markets, even when I'm not trading and uh today was just insane to say the least by the way if i keep looking down here it's because the laptop is down here and uh, the camera's up there whereas usually i have the camera here and the computer right side by side but anyways the bond market has been selling off it, it started really last week but it has continued to gain momentum and now we've got yields back at the highs again, past the highs here in Canada and the US, the treasuries are near the highs and it is insane. This means interest rates are going up even further. This is the part of the interest rate market which is dictated by open markets. You know, a lot of people don't realize that interest rates, this, the Fed and the Bank of Canada, Bank of England, Bank of Mexico, <laughs> they just modify and set the front end of the curve. So the overnight rate, but you've got all these different bonds of debt, which are your base level interest rate, the three month, the six month, the 12 month, the one year, two year, five year, 10 year, 30 year, and everything in between those. And those are basically your market base interest rate. So those are government bonds so they are deemed as completely risk-free because the government hasn't defaulted yet in the united states or in canada so these bonds are the base level and uh what and that's why they used to calculate like the 30-year fixed rate mortgage in the united states is calculated off the 30-year treasury as a base so you're always going to have the uh 30-year um, Treasury is going to have a massive effect on the 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And um, it when bonds are selling off, that also means mortgage backed securities are selling off as well, because they're a type of bond. And uh, there's no exceptions to this corporate debt, everything above the bonds, corporate debt, mortgage backed securities are all more risky. So um, without further ado, let's take a look and see what's going on. So the bonds are insane, to be honest. And uh, we've just had such big jumps. I mean, it is crazy. So let's take a look at some of these. So you've got the one year, which is at 2.84. You've got the two year now is over 3%, which just blows my mind because that thing was at like two and a half just a week ago, I think. And now you've got the five year has also inverted over the 30. So if you don't know what that means, essentially that means bad. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, so anytime you've got a higher rate on the front end, so you've got a two year or five year, for example, which are paying a higher yield than a 30 year, that's bad news. That means high probability of a recession. That means the yield curve has inverted, which is exactly what we've seen in Canada. And we've seen it in the United States too, um, but it has steepened since. So, and that's mainly probably to do with the stock market and what's happening there has kind of created that. But 
Interestingly, if we go down here, the five year 3.12. So 3.12%. This thing is what most mortgages in the United in, in the United States in Canada are based off this five year bond. So I'm going to pull it up on the screen and show you where this thing is come because moves in bonds like this are just unheard of. Like this is not normal moves. These these are typically the most stable markets, and you're seeing moves of jumping of nearly 25 basis points in a day. That is just bad news. So let's go over to this bond here and see what the chart looks like. So that's just the daily, but if we flick to the monthly so you can see what's happened. So look at this, guys. We literally, uh, let me flick it so it's on screen bigger for you guys. Um, so basically, just look at this. This thing, it went from 2.87. We went all the way down to 2.63, around that level we held it. But look at this. Since last week, it has just gone parabolic, over 50 basis points jump in a week. So it is up significantly, to say the least. Um, and, you know, a lot of people would say, well, it's prob probably the quantitative tightening or the rate hike that happened. But bear in mind, on a five-year bond, that isn't affecting. So when, well, it is to a certain degree, but not really when the overnight rate is at one and a half percent. Um, so it moves up a lot of things on the front end. But the fact that this is inverted now on the five year is just a terrible, terrible thing. And if we look at this again, so I can actually visually show you what I'm on about here. And you will have to imagine it if you're listening on Spotify. But if you look at this, you can basically ignore the blue line because that is last year. But you can see, actually, the blue line is a good thing because it shows you how this thing is meant to look like. A nice curve, and it should be going upwards. So it should just be going up in like a straight, a nice curve. That's what you want. So you've kind of got the curve there, but then it just kind of, it's completely flat, and then it inverts right here. So the 30-year. So the 30-year is below all these bonds, the 9, the 10, the 20 the eight, the seven, the six, the five, loads of different bonds and uh, even the four year. Yeah, the four years inverted too. So this is not good. This means a recession is likely coming faster. And if we see the two year go over the 30 year, then it's it's coming quickly. So something is going on that that is not a good sign when this things happen, when these moves happen in the markets when the yield curve inverts nine out of ten times you get a recession out of this or as you guys all know like a recession is pretty much baked into this cake at this point so the fact is there is going to be a recession we just don't know how bad is it going to be a depression is it going to be a recession we're not so sure at this point but the thing to me that makes it a depression is the inflationary aspect because it's, as I've said in other videos, the government, the way they measure inflation is just totally bogus. Like you can just completely throw it out. It's garbage. Um, as everybody knows, inflation is not at 6% or 7% or whatever they say it is. It's more like 20% plus. So, if you got inflation running at 20%, you go into recession, people start getting unemployed and, you know, then they're on unemployment benefits. And let's say those unemployment benefits are actually rising with the rate that the government says inflation is rate, rising at, then essentially you are literally like completely screwed. And I mean, employment benefits and everything like that unemployment benefits, not employment benefits, <laughs> but unemployment benefits, they're really just meant to be there to help whilst you look for another job. Now, it really depends how bad unemployment gets, but here's the way I look at it. The reason why we talk about debt so much and, and the bond market is the foundation of the stock market. So I'm less concerned 
when the bond market is making big moves, I'm less concerned about what the stock market is doing because, you know, if the bond market is selling off incredibly hard like it is right now, even if stocks are up, I'm very bearish, especially on the NASDAQ. I think the NASDAQ was up half a percent today. I mean, that is just ridiculous because with treasuries rising like they are, that is literally terrible news for all these tech companies. But maybe it's a lot of people thinking and predicting that there's going to be rate cuts coming into it. But really, that's a roll of the dice. Nobody knows. Like, nobody knows what the Bank of Canada, the Fed, is going to do when they're faced with rapidly high inflation and a recession. And it's like I said, here's, here's my take on it. I think it will go, in Canada at least, I'm not so sure about the Fed, I'm really 50-50 on that, but in Canada... I think that the Bank of Canada will view it and take it like it's inflation causing the recession, which is true. It is true that inflation is causing the recession and they will maybe go down the route of saying we have to raise rates further because we've got to kill inflation. Now, you really have to remember, guys, and I know I get a lot of you guys comment, extremely smart comments that are left on these videos. Um, and, you know, some of you guys say, like, it's supply chain issues and everything like that. But the Bank of Canada sees that they can control inflation. They believe in this thing called the Phillips curve. You can go and look that up after this video. It's really not that difficult to understand. But... They, they believe in all these archaic measures of how money works and they don't really control it. They think they control it, but they don't really control it. And that's the scary part of the situation. So the real estate bubbles that we see in Canada and the United States and a lot of the wealth and a lot of the economy is built around this cheap money lifestyle that people have been living withdraw from their home equity you know everything like that and people withdraw from their home equity they come down here mexico they buy condos all that sort of stuff and that's why we're teeing up looking at investing in mexico because we believe mexico will be a good place to invest mexico has a lot of potential with its economy to be one of the economies that comes out on the better side of this, um, potentially. And, you know, the thing is, we wouldn't buy at this instance because prices are inflated, like a lot of places anywhere that's been affected by stimulus money coming from the United States and Canada is inflated. But, you know, still prices are affordable here and they build, you know, if there's demand, they build here. So prices don't really fluctuate as much, um, but it is kind of insane. So this scenario that we see that's happening here with the yield curve, it's not a good one. This is a 90% probability that we head into a recession. And if you've got a 30-year above a four-year bond, <laughs> then why is that? What that essentially means is government debt, you're getting a higher return if you give the government your money for four years than 30 years. Why? Why is that? It's because people, the big money, I don't like to call it the smart money, I like to call it the big money. The big money thinks that down the road, things aren't going to be as good as they are today. And that's exactly why. So um, it, it's kind of crazy. And as you guys know, I don't know if you know much about our story, but we don't plan on like living in Mexico for the rest of our lives. We we would want to live, we'd want to invest in here and live here for a while, definitely set up businesses. Um, but long-term plans, we planned Costa Rica, Panama, even Uruguay, some of these other countries. We need to explore them and see what they have to offer. But the taxes are a big aspect of that. And I'm not a person that's about, oh, I just want to move there and pay zero tax. It's not like that at all. The way I view it is 
if you go to one of these countries, oh, I'm still going to pay tax, but I'm going to pay it myself locally on a local level. So, you know, if you can contribute to businesses in the local area, it's essentially better than paying taxes. Instead of giving to the government, they waste it on countless bureaucracies and total wastes of money. You can literally go to a business and say, hey, I can give you this loan. I can buy you this stuff. You can have it. Like, And that is really what we plan to do. So it's not about going to a place and just paying zero taxes. It's not about that at all. It's about the way government manages funds is just so bad. They waste so much money. Just look at the Cerveza sickness as a prime example. Look at insurance, mortgage insurance in Canada and the United States as an example. The taxpayer is insuring all the mortgages that are subprime. And we're going to get into this deep in a different live stream, but I've got a document that I really want to show you. And it's also, and it's really, it's about how in Ontario, there is a pension fund (laughs) that is publicly ran that is literally sponsoring subprime mortgages in Canada targeting immigrants. So, and, you know, they're eventually going to be looking for a bailout and as will a lot of these places, but it is just kind of mad. So another thing I just wanted to go over, let me see what I got. So let me share my screen again. Uh, Let me go in here. Getting off rambling. That's my problem. That is. (laughs) All right. So. If you take a look at this, this is Canada's private debt to GDP. Could be America. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, the United States, I should be clear, because America encompasses Mexico and Canada. But as you can see, guys, this is massive. Like the amount of debt in the system within Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom is very, very high. Like you can see, we go all the way out to 2020. You have a massive spike up in 2020. Why was that? Massive issuance of bonds. A lot of the issuance was used to buy companies stock, like especially public traded companies. They thought, wow, it's really low interest rates. We can just sell bonds and pay just very low interest rates and we can buy our stock pump up our stock price. And guess what? CEOs, executives, they get paid bigger bonuses because most CEOs and executives are getting paid their bonuses based on what the stock price does. It's a very, very bad situation because then these CEOs and executives, they don't really care about the long term. And it's as I've said with the bankers as well, guys, they don't really care about the long term. All they care about is the short term, how they can make so much money. And this is really greed. It's really greed encapsulated within the financial system that we see. So all this greed, it eventually has to come out and bleed out through the system. And it comes out through defaults, recessions, these things that are coming up right now. And you cannot avoid them. To people who are sat there thinking, ah, oh, yeah, no, there's not going to be a recession in Canada. People are too nice here or whatever it is you tell yourself, you know, there is going to be a recession. There is going to be a recession. The bubble is going to burst eventually. It will happen. It's inevitable because it's built on a Fugazi. <laughs> Let's, uh, I forgot his name, but anyway, in the Wolf of Wall Street, that movie. But it's a Fugazi. It doesn't exist. It's just made up. All the wealth is just fake. Nobody made that money. It was just fake, pumped up money from leverage, 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 leverage. If everybody just leverages up and buys homes, everything's going to be okay until the prices, even with the leverage, the payments are much too large that nobody can afford them then where do you go? What what happens at that point? You know, we have RV ratios in rents across 
the United States and, and in Canada, everywhere in Canada, Calgary, Vancouver, Edmonton, Toronto, even Nova Scotia, you look at the rents, the rents are more when you add in the property taxes, the maintenance, the rent, when you bundle it up all together, it's more than the rent. And that means that the landlord is subsidizing the purchase of that asset. And the reason they're doing that is because they believe in their head that real estate only goes up in price. And as we saw on that subreddit the other day, when we, if you haven't seen it, the one, the US one, which was about um, US mortgage fraud, people believe there's very little risk one guy said, and I quote, I think it was something like, um, oh, I put myself on the spot now and I can't remember. But it was something like, you've got, like, you are, uh, you can borrow against real estate. There's no risk attached to it. And that is just insane, isn't it? When you really think about it, because it was only 2008 to 2014 or whatever, the real estate market was not in a good place in the United States. And literally, like eight years later, they are saying real estate never goes down. In price. <laughs> and that should alarm people, but it doesn't. And you know, it is madness when you think about that. I just can't believe it. But it's the way humans are just greedy. It is just such a powerful emotion that I have just had to battle in trading so, so hard. Believe me, guys, greed is the hardest thing to get through in trading. It is the hardest barrier to break through. You hold trades too long. You watch them go from a good profit to being stopped out at a loss. Because you're greedy, you're like, oh, I want that round number. I want, you know, $300 or whatever it may be. I want that round number. I'm not going to take it here at 288 because I want my 300 And of course, it never goes there, comes straight back down, stops you out. You lose everything. And I've suffered that myself. I'm no spring chicken. We've all had to go through the bullpen to get to where we are as traders and you have to go through the rough times and there has been many rough times and low points i can tell you that but i'm just telling you that greed it's such a powerful emotion and i know that firsthand and anybody who trades financial markets knows that firsthand and and many people who bought stocks last year know that firsthand you know they i'm sure when things started to go south and markets started to tank and like Peloton went down 30%. They probably thought maybe I should just sell it and take a loss. But no, what was it? It was greed. Greed was saying, nah, it will go back. It will go back to all time highs again. And then we can sell there. And of course, it never does. And now it's down like 80%. And this is just the reality. It really is. So uh, <laughs> it is. D Trent says, Gordon Gecko is going to troll you, Luke. <laughs> yeah, you know, Trader586, uh, I think you've been doing this way longer than I have, and greed is powerful, but fear is worth. I, I, I think it's, you know, it depends. It depends on the person, but it's either one. And fear, I, I know a few traders who suffer from fear very, very badly, and I'm the opposite. But I think that's worse, to be honest, because I, I, when I started out, I lost more. Whereas if you're fearful, you're not going to take those trades. <laughs> so you can save yourself some money in that respect when you're learning. But yeah, I believe you're right there. Like you're, it's, it's, it's either fear or it's greed. And fear can be, again, something that just absolutely takes people for a ride. And we are, we are seeing that play out. We're about to see it play out in the real estate market. And greed and fear, they, they, they are the opposite of each other in a way that you see greed on the way up, fear comes on the way down. But we know fear is more powerful because all you have to do is look at the way stocks react. They go 
down very quickly. So like that old Wall Street analogy, not analogy, metaphor, or whatever you want to call it. But stocks, they take the stairs up and they jump out. No, it's bulls take the stairs up and uh, bears jump out the window. And it's saying that when a stock goes up, it's very gradual. But when it goes down, it's just like a crash. And that's because of fear. The fear is just so. And I trade. That is what I trade best because I can sniff out fear in the markets. Greed is more difficult for me, probably because I'm more that way <laughs> inclined, or at least used to be. But you know, you try and battle all these emotions as much as you can, and uh, you'll never get rid of them. You're always going to cave to them at some points in life, but you've just got to be aware. It's all about having awareness of what you do. And uh, I talk to myself when I trade. I say, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. Um, so it's verbally acknowledged. Otherwise, it's just all these little thoughts just going on in your head. Anyways, I've got way off topic there. Um, but I just wanted to show you something. Because again, you can see on this bond, it's uh, Van Eck Moody's triple B rated debt. And if you take a look at this, um, so this is down like half a percent, which is pretty substantial for a bond. Let, let me be clear on that. Like some of the Canadian bonds have fell very significantly, like over one percent. And you can see that if we go to a yearly, like you've had another top there. So you hit a bottom and then it's just suddenly started selling off again. So it's kind of like what happened at this point or what happened at that point. So we could you know, catch another bounce, another one there. But it looks incredibly similar, but it is kind of madness when you, uh, there we go, um, when you look at this, how much it's come down. These things are just not designed to go down that much. And if you look at the holdings, GE, Standard Chartered, which is a UK bank, Barclays, which is another UK bank, you've got T-Mobile, in there, which is obviously the cell phone company, Dan Dansk Bank, I don't know that one. Um, but yeah, Altria Group, that's a anti, like, anti-smoking type company, I believe they do stuff like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's just incredible, guys, because bonds are very, <laughs> well, they're meant to be secure. Like a lot of funds are holding like, you know, whatever it is, 15, 20% bonds. Like, I mean, it's, it's insane the volatility that we're seeing in bonds. You know, one company in particular that holds a ton of bonds for the yield aspect because they're meant to be safe is, of course, BlackRock. <laughs> so, you know, these pension funds... They hold them because they're meant to be safe. You know, if they have a lot of these pension funds also have derivative products on margin, there's all different kinds of things that they're going into. And this is how a lot of pension funds blew up in 2008, because essentially they couldn't generate any liquidity when they needed it because they would go to sell their bonds. Their bonds are, have tanked. They can't take that much of a loss on it. I mean, it's insane. And the amount of speculation that is done off the back of just the bond yields in the treasury market is billions and just hundreds of billions, if not a trillions of dollars that are betting against where bonds are going to go. So it really, really is crazy. So anyway, guys, um, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> We're going to go down to the pool for a swim, I think. And I'm sorry it was late, but, you know, it is kind of insane. And we're going to cover that CMHC thing and what's going on with that in another future live stream. I didn't say hit the like button on this one. <laughs> so I guess we'll see how many people have got that memory of hitting the like button <laughs> because it's right on the end. And Let's face it, I think probably around 20% hang around to this point in the live stream. Most people, about 50% they give up, which is fair enough. It's a 30-minute video. It's quite a long one. 
So anyway, guys, revert to me and says, how is Mexico, brother? Yeah, Mexico is really good. You know, Mexico, since arriving here, we have never felt safer because, you know, a lot of people were saying about concerns of safety and everything in Mexico and definitely certain parts of Mexico are very, very bad. And even the Riviera Maya in 2020 wasn't exactly great. Um, because of what happened. I mean, that's a long stories anyway that I could get into. But anyway, like there is police everywhere. The place we're staying in is locked down like a fortress. Um, you know, you feel very safe. And we're traveling between different places. Like we're not just staying in the condo resort that we're in. We're going off out in the rental car. We're going to Puerto Morales tomorrow, I think, to snorkel there. We were in Acumal today, and uh, we went. We walked like we walked like seven miles on Sat Sunday, and uh, <laughs> oh god, that was uh, because they had so much rain before we arrived. They had a big tropical storm on a. I mean, it's humid all the time. It's subtropical. Well, it's not. It's tropical place, not subtropical. Um, but they had so much rain that on Sunday when the sun came out, it was just so humid. So we decided to go to this this beach that was far to go snorkel in there. And my God, <laughs> that was just. I have never sweated so much in my life. Like. That was just unbelievable. I could not wait to get in the ocean at the other end of there. Um, but it's better now. Like the humidity's come down a little bit now. All that's just all the rain and stuff has evaporated and whatnot. But, you know, going to the grocery store here is really interesting as well because um, I tweeted this out. But, you know, it's interesting to see how Mexico, like, nearly all the food staples, all the fruit, the vegetables are from Mexico. And when we're in Canada, like everything is from the United States. And a lot of the stuff is actually from Mexico through the United States. So it's just been packaged in the United States. It's actually come from Mexico. And it just shows how fragile Canada's food supply chain really is. And we know that's a problem. And Everybody knows the food supply chain in the United States is a problem too. You know, the, the amount of arable land in the United States and Canada is shrinking each year. And it's not a good situation. Of, I mean, we're already going to start to see food shortages, I believe, in the not so distant future. I already walk around the grocery store and a lot of the time many different products are missing. But guess what, guys? The grocery stores here in Mexico, they are fully stocked. They got everything, absolutely everything. There's no empty shelves. So and the fact is the food is so cheap here. You know, even to go eat out at a restaurant, you can eat out for ten dollars a plate. Like that is very, very cheap. You can drink margaritas for three dollars if you're not on fifth anyway but there is loads of different places you can go and you can eat out very inexpensively here in mexico but even if you want to eat at home like that's even cheaper like we bought bananas i bought like 20 bananas yeah i've been i, I love bananas but I've been eating so much fruit, melon, bananas, mangoes. It's just all so cheap. So, you know, it really shows how much of the price that we pay in Canada is freight and in the United States too. It's the cost of getting those goods to you that is so expensive. So I think that's very interesting to see because bananas especially like – I worked it out 30 cents a kilogram, um, which they normally do it in pounds in Canada. And it's about 80 cents in Calgary. It was always cheaper in Ontario. I know that because the I actually used to sometimes go. It was a client at the place I worked to the food terminal in Ontario, which was absolutely massive in Etobicoke. And uh a lot of the food comes in there and it gets distributed even from there to the United States. It's a big hub. 
A lot of food goes out to Michigan from there. A lot of products get shipped from Ontario and they go out to the States too. It's a big shipping and logistics hub as well. Um, but it's very interesting, you know, because it just shows how much of the price. Um, it, I mean, even the pineapple, like the pineapple was like a buck and it wasn't even on sale. And we paid on sale price three dollars for a pineapple a couple of weeks ago in Calgary. And it wasn't even as big as the one we've got here It was like a small one. So that's a huge amount of money percentage increase when you really think about it. So the food is actually cheap. It's the freight that's not cheap and it's getting more expensive. So if you can go live somewhere where you can grow your own food or you can live closer to the food, then you're doing yourself a favor because in the future, long term, guys, it's like I said, the arable land, it's shrink shrinking and that's not going to stop. So food is just going to continually rise in price. And uh, Canada is the last hand. The United States is before. So that's the way I think about it. Incredibly, incredibly uh, fragile food supply chain in Canada that's reliant on the United States. And, you know, we really saw how that works when the United States, well, when we all had this Cerveza sickness, because, you know, the United States was blocking exports of certain medical equipment to, the, to uh, Canada, you know, so come a food shortage, would they do the same thing? Possibly. Like who, who if they did it for medical supplies, then do you think they'll do it for food? Do you think they're going to protect their own citizens first before they worry about Canadians? I think they will, because that's just the way it works. And uh, you really have to just realize that. And that's a long term thing anyway. But we want to be in a place where we can grow all our own food. We think it's important and uh, it's one thing that we prioritize, you know. So anyways, but yeah, it's just incredible to see the price differences, I think. And I, <laughs> but yeah, you got to get close to that food source to see it. And it's insane. And the gas prices here in Mexico are also ridiculous because I didn't actually know it until we got here, but the government is subsidizing the gas prices. It's costing them a fortune. Um, they, they're using, because basically Pemex is the national, it's, an, it's like owned by the government. And all there is no Shell and Exxon Mobil or anything like that. So it's Pemex that gets all the oil, and Mexico is a big oil producer as well. So all the excess profits that they've made, they are subsidizing the gas prices with. A lot of oil producing nations do that. Um, but you know, it's got so extreme now that Mexico is actually running at a loss, subsidizing the gas prices. I mean, the gas prices are insane. I worked it back to about 140 a litre, which is nuts because <laughs> it's like got to be $2 now in Canada. I mean, before we left Alberta, it was like up to nearly 185. But with the way gasoline futures have gone up, they're up like 5 6% since then. So you're talking what? two dollars everywhere now nationally in canada and in the united states what six seven dollars a gallon like it's insane but yeah i mean uh crazy 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 so anyway thanks uh revert to means for that and check out revert to means his channel because he's got a great channel going on there too gotta support all us small youtubers we gotta stick together we have tight communities here we all know each other Anyway, guys, thank you so much for hanging with me on this live stream. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, anyways, we'll be doing more live streams. I got some different things that I want to put out. So we'll see what goes on. Going to go for a late night. Well, it's not late night. It's only 8 p.m. here. But, <laughs> but we're going to go for a swim now. But anyway, guys, thank you so much. Uh, please leave a comment after this video and just let me know if the internet was decent, like if the microphone worked, if you could hear me okay, just one of you, please. <laughs> and then, uh, then I'll know it was all good um, for next time.
But anyway, guys, I'll see you in the next video. As usual, peace. Take it easy. See you in the next one.